Take your Bibles and open it to Ephesians. I've said that for about seven weeks now. And we'll continue to say that for the next 952 Sundays. As we rush through the book of Ephesians. I'm joking, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Diamonds and dust. That's what I'm calling this series because Ephesians is one of those books that just divides itself right in half. Chapters 1, 2, and 3, diamonds. What do I mean by that? Chapters 1, 2, and 3 talk about our riches in Christ, the blessings that we have, all that is ours in Jesus Christ. Diamonds. Chapters 4, 5, and 6, dust. What do I mean by that? I mean that our faith is to be lived out on the dusty streets of this community and this county. Our faith is to be a shoe leather kind of faith and we are to live it out and that's what you will find in chapters 4, 5, and 6. You will find very practical, very real life stuff on how you and I are to live. This morning we're still in chapter 1. We're going to talk about the diamond of a Lord who is ruling and reigning. The diamond of a risen, ruling, reigning Lord. Chapter 1 of Ephesians, we'll begin in verse 15. Before we do that, we got to pray for each other. We got to pray. I, I was reminded again this week of the earthen vessel that I am. And my prayer today is that you will see not the earthen vessel, but you will see the treasure in the words that I say. And then I want to pray for you. You got to pray for yourself that you'll hear and not miss what God wants to say to you today. God wants to change something in your life today based on what you hear. He wants to change, move you more like Jesus, move you in a different direction maybe even because of something you'll hear today and you, you don't want to miss it. So let's pray for one another. You pray for me, pray for yourself, and I'll do the same. Let's, let's do that. Let's do that. Father, we thank you the truth that we just heard those men sing, you, you are Messiah, Lord of all. And Father, that's, that's what our, our, our text will tell us today. Let us see the implications of that on our prayer life. Father, I pray you'll speak through me and, and to every one of us today. We all are at different places in our spiritual journey, Father, and only your Holy Spirit can meet us at our point of need. So do that today through your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why do you pray? Why do you pray? There are multiple answers to that question, of course. You are commanded to pray. Have you ever thought about that? That's why I pray, because the Lord tells me to pray. I am commanded to pray. But I also believe in prayer. Because I've experienced answered prayer. You, you have experienced answered prayers in your life. Why do you pray? You need guidance. You need wisdom. You need strength. You need courage. You need and the list could go on and on. That's why you pray, because you need those things. Why do you pray? You say, Pastor, I'm at the end of my rope in my life. I, I am at the end of my rope. I can't hang on much longer, I don't think. And that guy that said, when you're at the end of the rope, tie a knot and hang on, I, I'd like to meet him and punch him right in the nose. That's, that's why I pray, because I'm at the end of my rope. Why do you pray? What I really mean when I ask that question, why do you pray, is that do you believe there's a basis for it? Do you really believe that there is a reality that merits you praying? Are there grounds for prayer? 
What is that basis? What is that reality? What are those grounds? What is the hope that you have that your prayers will be answered? Why do you even have hope that your prayers will be answered? It's those questions that I want to answer for you this morning. It's those kind of questions that our text deals with this morning. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. And if you didn't bring a copy of God's Word with you today, pull one out of the pew rack there in front of you. There's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. And if you'll find page 976, you'll find Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. That's page 976. Now, before we get into this, I want to describe what you're about to read. I want to describe what you're about to experience as we read verses 15 down to verse 23. First, there is a prayer. Then there is the basis for that prayer. Then there is the grounds, really, for all prayer. And that is where we will spend our time this week. We will spend our time this Sunday morning on the grounds and the basis for prayer. The reality that makes our prayer possible. Then next week, we will come back and look at the actual prayer. Next week, we will come back and look at the prayer itself. But I wanted to give you the ground, the foundation, the reality of why we even bother praying. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now here comes Paul's prayer for the Ephesian believers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ. Now, next week, we'll look at that. What a marvelous prayer that is. What a great prayer that is to pray for yourself and for your children, for your grandchildren. But now, look, Paul is going to give us the basis and the grounds of why we even pray a prayer like that. Verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Here's the life point this morning. Here's where we're going. You can pray a prayer like that. That's the first part of this section. You can pray a prayer like that because you serve a Lord like this. You can pray a prayer like, Lord, give me or give my child or give my grandchild a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that I can know how to deal with life. Lord, give me a spirit of wisdom so I can know how to deal with the issues and the temptations that face me. Lord, give me a spirit of wisdom so I can know how to make the right decisions and deal with what comes at me. Lord, open my eyes that I may know, open the eyes of my daughter, open the eyes of my grandson, that, that, that he may know the calling that you have on his life and all that that is involved with. And Lord, I want to know your power in my life. Lord, give my son power in his life. Give my granddaughter power in her life. Lord, power over sin and power over temptation and power over discouragement and power over doubt and power over trouble and power over insecurity. You can pray a prayer like that because you serve a Lord like this. 
First, a Lord who is risen yet seated. Notice that. Notice that in verse 20. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in all heavenly places. Circle the word raised and the word seated. When he raised him from the dead. You can pray a prayer like that because you serve a Lord like this. It is a Lord who is risen. Let that sink in. We just casually say that. And yet the reality of it needs to fall fresh on our spirits this morning. Your Lord is risen from the dead. He is not dead. He is alive. Your Lord is alive. Confucius is dead. Buddha is dead. Muhammad is dead. Listen to me, folks. I'm following the guy who predicted his death and his resurrection and then pulled it off. That's who I'm following. That's who I've anchored my life in. I've anchored my life in the guy that said, you kill, you destroy this temple and I'm going to raise it up in three days. You put me in the ground and I'm going to come out of the ground. I'm following the guy who predicted his own resurrection and then made it true. My Lord is alive. Now, if you doubt the historicity of that, you have a great problem with history. You need to go back and look at the documents from the first century. If you doubt that, oh, it's just a hoax, Jesus really didn't rise from the dead... You need to go back and look at the history and the documents from the first century. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was joyously preached by his first followers. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was continuously shared by eyewitnesses. Jesus' resurrection authenticated his ministry. It secured his redemption work. Jesus' resurrection now makes possible his work as your high priest, and that's the word seated. You can pray a prayer like that because you serve a Lord like this. You serve a Lord who is risen, yet seated. I want you to see this morning the significance of the word seated, and I've put the scriptures there on the screen. I want to read them for you. I want to start in Hebrews chapter 1, and I want to read verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. This is, of course, a reference to Jesus. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, why did he sit down? Work was done. There's nothing more that needs to be done to secure your salvation. There's nothing more that needs to be done to make possible for you to live in a relationship with God. It's through Jesus Christ, who when he had made purification for the sins, sat down. Now, why is that significant that he sat down because his work was done. Well, that's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat 
down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies, we're going to talk about this in just a moment, until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. Every priest in the Old Testament never sat down. There was not a chair in the Holy of Holies. There was not a chair in the temple. They didn't sit down. Why? Because their work was never done. They're going to be back in there next week. They're going to be back in there next year. They're going to be back in there week after week and year after year because their work is never done. When Jesus, it says, offering this body made the single sacrifice for sins, he sat down. Done. No more sacrifice needs to be made at all for your sin. So what's he doing? Hebrews 7.25. Hebrews 7.25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Connect Hebrews 7.25 with Romans 8.31. Since he ever lives to make intercession for them, Romans 8.31 says this. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us. How will he also not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. So Christ, raised, risen from the dead, seated at the right hand of God. And look, Ephesians says, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. That is the right hand, the place of supreme privilege and authority. And so what is Jesus doing there? He is interceding for you and me. He is taking our request and bringing them before the Father. He is taking things we don't even know about that need to be done in our life and bringing them before the Father. Jesus is interceding for you and me, having risen from the dead, been given the right hand, the position in place of the right hand, the supreme authority, and he sits down and he is now interceding for you and me. You can pray a prayer like that because you serve a Lord like this. He is raised, risen, yet seated. I like the story of the college girl. One morning she wrote mom and dad an email. It said... Dear Mom and Dad, just thought I'd drop, a, drop you a note to clue you in on my plans. I've fallen in love with a guy named Jim. He quit school after grade 11 to get married. About a year ago, he got a divorce. We've been going steady for two months and plan to get married in the fall. Until then, I've decided to move in to his apartment. I think I might be pregnant. At any rate, I dropped out of school last week, although I'd like to finish college sometime in the future. Later that evening, she sent Mom and Dad a second email. Dear Mom and Dad, I just wanted you to know that everything in this morning's email is false. None of it is true. But Mom and Dad, it is true that I got a C in French and a D in math. And dad, I need you to send more money. (laughs) Now there is one sharp daughter. You know why? Because she knows the value of perspective. So much of life depends on perspective. Less than perfect grades and needing more money are not that bad after all. Get the proper perspective of Jesus when you pray. Would you keep, would you maintain 
the perspective that Jesus is risen from the dead. He is at the right hand of the Father and he is interceding for you and you can pray bold prayers because you serve a Lord like that. John Newton wrote Amazing Grace, of course. John Newton also wrote these little words, Thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring for his grace and power are such none can ever ask too much. What bold prayer do you need to pray? What would be your boldest prayer? What is the boldest prayer you could think of? What is stopping you from praying it? You have a Lord who is risen and seated at the right hand of God. So you need to ask and you need to seek and you need to knock. Bold praying. You can pray a prayer like that because you serve a Lord like this. There's a second thing. You can pray a prayer like that because you serve a Lord like this. He is a Lord who is above all, yet over all. He is above all, yet over all. Look at verse 21. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, Not only in the age, but excuse me, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. We we, we serve a Lord who is above all, yet over all. Look again at the place your Lord now occupies. Verse 21 says, He is far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. Those are words which refer to the various ranks and orders in the unseen spiritual world. They refer both to holy angels and demons. They refer to the good spirits We often call them angels, and they refer to evil spirits. Now, I don't want to bring anything to you that maybe you had never thought about before, but, but do you understand there is an unseen spiritual world? Do you understand there is an unseen spiritual world that is even more real than the world that you and I live in? And that's why over in the 6th chapter, and I put it on the screen for you, that's why over in the 6th chapter of Ephesians and verse 10, Paul is going to say, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against, and it's the same words, but against rulers and authorities against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You see, there is an unseen spiritual world, but your Lord has been exalted far above all of that. And whatever authority those spirits have, good or evil, Whatever authority those spirit beings have, they are all inferior to the authority of the Lord Jesus. Look at the next phrase in verse 21. Not only is he far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, he is above every name that is named. Now that refers to human beings, not spirit beings. It refers to human beings. Now, there is, of course, no rank or title that a man or woman on this earth has that is superior to your Lord Jesus. Not president, not dictator, not supreme leader, not chairman, not even boss. No human is superior in authority to that of your Lord Jesus. Then look at the next phrase. Not only in this age, but also in the age to come. That means not now, not ever will there be anyone superior to your Lord Jesus. 
not not a spirit being or a human being. Your Lord Jesus is far above them all. There is not a being in heaven or on earth to whom Jesus is not superior over. Now, Now hang with me. I'm going somewhere with this, okay? I'm going somewhere with this. Verse 22 says, He put all things under his feet. That's everything is under our Lord's dominion. He is above all. He is over all. And then then the next phrase is just an astounding phrase in verse 22. And gave him as head over all things to the church. Gave Jesus as head over all things to the church. And that's you and me. That is an astounding statement. That boggles, that boggles my mind. Listen, listen, this is where I'm going with this. Our risen Lord, our seated Lord, our far above every name Lord is God's gift to the church. That's you and me. The exaltation of our Lord Jesus is not just an honor that's been conferred upon him, But the exaltation of our Lord Jesus has a practical purpose. The good of the church. The benefit of the church. Now, here here is the good. Jesus is the supreme authority over his church. He guides it. He governs it. He leads it. And there is a vital union between Jesus and his people. Again, that's you. A vital union between Jesus and his people that is as close and as real as the connection between your physical head and your physical body. And you have your source of life in him and you are sustained by his power and you are directed by his spirit and you are protected by his mercy and you are strengthened by his grace. The exalted Lord has been given by God as head over the church, head over all things, and he gave him as head over all things to the church. Hang with me. You know the names Chip and Joanna Gaines. You know those names. You watch the show, Fixer Upper. I'm sure they have transformed Waco into a tourist destination. I mean, nobody used to go to Waco anymore. Where are you going on vacation? I'm going to Waco. What? Was the stagecoach in booked? I mean, is that why you're going to Waco? I mean... No, they single-handedly transformed Waco into a tourist destination, silos and Magnolia Market. Chip Gaines said recently, we are all just looking for something that is real. We are all just looking for something that is real. Now, here's what's real. Chip Gaines knows this. Here's what's real. Jesus is the supreme authority. And not only does he guide and govern the church, he's been given, that's what the verse says, as head of all things, head over all things, been given to the church. But, but Jesus is the supreme authority, not only over all the church, but over your life. He guides and governs your life, your life. Because you are connected to him. You are connected to Jesus. A a connection that is as real as your head to your body. And when you pray, because Jesus is far above every power and rule and dominion and name, when you pray, because Jesus is over all things, Nothing comes into your life that the Lord did not will or permit. You get that? He's Lord over every spiritual being. He's Lord over the good ones and the evil ones. 
He's Lord over every person on this earth, regardless of their title. There is no creature unseen or seen that is superior to. They all are inferior of our Lord Jesus. And you are connected to him with a connection that is real as your head to your body. And so... When you pray, nothing comes into your life that he does not will or permit because he's Lord over it all. Over it all. He's Lord. Wow. Wow. And some of you right now are struggling with why did then, Pastor, why did he permit this? Certainly this is not his will. Why would he permit this? I don't know that I have the answer to that. I don't know that you will always or ever know the answer to that. But I do know this. You will be sustained by his power and you will be protected by his mercy and you will be strengthened by his grace. We're all just looking for something that is real. And this is what's real. You serve a Lord who is in control, who is superior to all, who has already conquered anything you face he's Lord above all yet over all and you can pray a prayer like that because you serve a Lord like this now there's a final truth we need to grasp You can pray a prayer like that because you serve a Lord like this. He is a Lord who is invisible, yet visible. Verse 23 says, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, which is his body. The church is his body, visible on earth. That's you and me. That's you and me. We are the body of of Christ. You see, the church is not merely a kingdom where Jesus rules as supreme authority. That's true, though. But the church is not merely a kingdom where Jesus rules as supreme authority. The church is not merely an institution run by Jesus, who is our CEO. Now listen to me. The church is not even a vast congregation of men and women who believe the moral truths that Jesus taught. The church is Jesus' body visible on the earth. That's you and me. The church is pervaded by Jesus' presence. The church, you and me, we are invigorated by his life. The church, you and me, are filled with his gifts. And I put the passage of Scripture there, and I'm not going to read all of those verses, but 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. Let me read that verse and then let me read the last verse. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are... Though many are one body, that's referring to your physical body. The members, the body's one, it has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, they're one body. So it is with Christ's body. And then Paul goes on to talk about spiritual gifts. And he says, some of you are like a foot, some of you are like a hand, some of you are like an ear, some of you are like an eye. We're not all the same, but we're all different, but yet we all make up the body of Christ. And the foot cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the hand can't say to the ear, I don't need you. And the ear can't say to the eye, I don't need you. No, we all need each other. God has arranged the members of the body as he chose. And verse 27 says, we are the body of Christ. 
and individually members of it. We're Christ's hands and feet in this world. We are Christ's eyes and ears in this world. And when you pray, listen to me, and when you pray, most of the time the answer will come by your Lord Jesus sending a member of his body to serve you, to answer you. Most of the time, the answer to your prayer is going to come through a member of Christ's body who is sent to you because, after all, we are the visible of the invisible, the visible expression of the invisible Lord. So when you pray and you're seeking God for an answer, watch the people who come into your life. They could be the answer you're looking for. They could have the answer you're looking for. They could be sent there by God in answer to your prayers. So when you pray, watch the people that God sends into your life and then turn it around. Be sensitive to the voice of the Spirit who sends you into the lives of other people. Why has that person been on your heart lately? Why is it in the back of your mind, I need to call them? Why does it always seem to, that you run into them on the aisle at Brookshire's or in the Dairy Queen when you're eating or any place like that? Why is it? Because God wants to use you as hands, his hands and feet in their life as an answer to their prayer. You can pray a prayer like that because you serve a Lord like this, a Lord who is invisible, but visible through his people, who are indeed his hands and his feet. So let's do two things. Let's change our perspective on prayer. With spiritual eyes, let us see Jesus high and lifted up seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. Let's change our perspective on prayer and then be bold because we can pray a bold prayer because we serve a Lord who is risen, seated over all and above all. Let's change our perspective on prayer. Second thing is, let's change our perspective on Jesus. Some of you need to do that today. You need to change your perspective on Jesus. You know what the biblical term for that is? Repentance. Repentance. That's all repentance is. It's a changing of your perspective about who Jesus is. When you walked in here this morning, you thought Jesus was this and this and that. And now, you believe Jesus is risen from the dead. His death on the cross was payment for your sin. Change your perspective on who Jesus is. Is that what you need to do? Let's bow and pray. Heavenly Father, we we love you and we thank you for the truth of your word today. Now we know, Father. Now now we know why we pray. There's a basis for it. There's a ground for it. There's a reality, Father, that undergirds every offering of prayer that we make to you. And it has to do with our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And Father, let us get that perspective. Let us change our perspective on prayer today. And Father, I pray for those today who need to change their perspective on Jesus. May the Holy Spirit convict of sin today, Father, of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's his, that's his work.
And let, let some see today, Father, for the first time that Jesus is indeed risen from the dead. He predicted his death and his resurrection, and he pulled it off. So, wow, who could that be other than the Savior? The one who does indeed have the answer to life. And may they repent and come to faith in him today. That's my prayer. Father, do... Do your work of drawing sinners to Jesus today. It's in his name, his holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. In a moment we'll stand and we will sing. Prompted by the Spirit of God, would you turn out of your aisle, come out of that aisle, come down, come down. Come, come down this aisle and share with us, my staff, a decision that you're making to place faith in Christ. Maybe you just need to come to the altar to pray. Maybe you need to unite with our church. This is one of the moments and one of the ways you can join our church. You come. Your testimony to us is, I'm already a Christian pastor, already saved, know the Lord. I want to plant my life in this place, in this church. We'd welcome you today. So, every Sunday it's not tradition it's not something we just do because we've always done it we do it because God is not through with us yet this morning we need to give him time to speak so let's stand let's 